Welcome and thanks for joining today's presentation on partnering with gateway communities to advance landscape conservation. My name is Brian Fainer and I'm with the National Park Service and help support our Connected Conservation Initiative. The Connected Conservation webinar series focuses on how NPS staff and partners can use various tools and strategies to conserve NPS resources at the landscape level. Partnerships with gateway communities outside parks are often among the most important aspects of landscape conservation. As such, for the next six months, our webinar series will focus on partnering with communities to further conservation. You can register, register for our planned webinars and view past recordings by going to our internal Connected Conservation Toolkit, which is accessible to Department of Interior staff and the Network for Landscape Conservation website, which is open to the public. And there's links to both of those websites in the chat box. We will post a recording of today's webinar following the presentation. And throughout today's presentation, feel free to plug in questions into the questions box. We'll look at everyone's questions following the presentation. As a reminder, our webinar series is open to federal and state agencies, nonprofits, and other conservation partners, so feel free to invite your colleagues to future webinars. Today, we have two excellent presenters with us. Uh, Misha Mitar is the Senior Project Manager for the Maine Coast Heritage Trust and is based in, on Mount Desert Island, which is where Acadia National Park is located. Mount Desert Island also happens to be where the Maine Coast Heritage Trust got its start and continues to fill the role of the local land trust for the areas surrounding the park. Misha works with landowners and partners like the Park Service on land projects which enhance the conservation legacy of the region and benefit the local community. Stephanie Clement is the Conservation Director for the Friends of Acadia. Uh, since 1997. She oversees all of Friends of Acadia's programs with primary responsibility for the Friends of Acadia's advocacy, transportation, and resource management issues. Stephanie is also the primary contact for park staff for many park policy initiatives and serves as the principal liaison with community officials. Now, before we get started, I also wanted to mention that we have Kevin Schneider, who is Acadia National Park Superintendent. Uh, he's with us and, and will be with us to answer questions uh, following the presentation, but I wanted to hand it over to Kevin to say a few words. Well, thanks, Brian, and um, real heartfelt thanks to Misha and Stephanie for participating in this as well and, and sharing uh, their vantage points working, working on the ground. Um, you know, Acadia National Park really is one of those kinds of parks that you manage from the inside out. We really are embedded um, I mean, from the outside in, actually, because we're so embedded in communities. Um, the park really is part of the communities, and the communities are part of the park. And so uh, just the nature of this place requires that we work with partners uh, to get our, our business done. And these partnerships are, are crucial. Um, both Friends of Acadia and Maine Coast Heritage Trust have different skill sets and can bring sort of different assets to the table. Um, and yet, we all work together to accomplish uh, the work of preserving this spectacular place. You know, it's just a couple of simple examples. In many cases, landowners don't always want to talk to the federal government when they're, they've got something on their mind or when they want to perhaps make a, a donation. Having a private partner um, that they can talk to uh, sometimes uh, facilitates a conversation in a much more effective way. Um, in, in other cases, partners can do things that we just can't do. Uh, they can ask people for donations, for example, whereas we can't do that um, in, in the National Park Service. Uh, partners are more nimble. Uh, oftentimes, partners can react more quickly uh, than, than we can, whether it's getting a, a land deal done or, or dealing with a property issue. You know, it can take years to get an appropriation for land and water conservation funding, uh, whereas Sometimes partners can, can raise that money much, much faster and, and we can work a deal where, where the partner acquires a property and then ultimately we, we sort of reimburse the partner with LWCF funding uh, years later when we finally get the funding. So uh, I'll just kind of keep it at that for the time being so we can get straight into Misha and Stephanie's presentation. But um, thanks, Brian, for organizing this and, and thanks, Misha and Stephanie, for, for sharing your perspectives. 
Great. Thanks, Kevin. All right, Misha, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Brian and Kevin, for the introduction. Uh, this is Stephanie speaking uh, for Friends of Acadia. Um, we are thrilled to be part of this important uh, webinar series, and we hope we can serve as a resource moving forward as well. We're breaking our presentation down today into uh, these sections, introducing a little bit about the park, why community partnerships are important here, um, then what Friends of Acadia is working on to try to advance landscape conservation, then turn it over to MCHT for that conversation, lessons learned in working together, sharing a few resources, and then opening it up, leaving plenty of time for questions. First, a little orientation to the park. Um, their park has three main sections, which you see in green on the map here. The section that most people are familiar with is on Mount Desert Island, which is also known as MDI, so you may hear us use those initials, and that we're referring to that island section that you see in the middle of the map. The section to the uh, further east is the Skudik Peninsula. It's the only mainland section of the park. And this map of the Skudik Peninsula park portion is a little out of date. Actually, the green would extend further up to the Winter Harbor words there. And then the last section of the park is Isla Ho, which is uh, accessible by ferry and really offers a more remote experience. There's a long history of community-based conservation here at Acadia. As Kevin mentioned, really it's intertwined with local communities. The park was established in 1916 as Surtamon National Monument from a patchwork of donated lands. So as a result, you see the convoluted boundary that evolved. And visitors often don't know whether they're inside or outside the park as they travel the state and local road systems. And the towns are right on the border of the park. Acadia is known for um, outstanding natural resources and coastal scenery. Um, and we have wonderful wildlife, more than 40 mammals, 300 bird species. We're known for intact ecosystems. The park is really on the edge of two biomes, the northern coniferous forest and the southern deciduous forest. As a result, you see a lot of species diversity at the edge of their ranges. And the park has really been working hard to try to preserve that um, kind of naturally functioning ecosystem in the, face, in the face of climate change. The park has some of the darkest night skies on the East Coast, and many of the park's lakes and ponds serve as the drinking water supplies for local communities. So really, uh, it's preserving those resources inside and outside of the park is what's at stake here, and that's why we're here at this webinar today. The park also has exemplary cultural resources. Acadia is the homeland for the Wabanaki people, and the park maintains positive connections with the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet tribes today. There's also outstanding cultural resources from the era of John D. Rockefeller Jr., including 45 miles of crushed stone, non-motorized carriage roads, 17 carriage road bridges, like the one that you see on the slide here, 120 miles of hiking trails, and 33 miles of historic road systems and four lighthouses. And as a result of all these great resources, it's an incredibly wonderful park for family-friendly recreational opportunities. Diversity of trails, a diversity of opportunities to get on the water, go to museums, rent your bike, and go. As a result of all of this, park visitation has grown by about 59% over the last decade, and we receive about 3.4 to 3.5 million visits a year. Um, most visitors come from the months of May through October, dwarfing the local populations, which I wrote down on the slide there, um, in the gateway communities. The types of visitation have changed over the years, um, including we now receive about 200 cruise ship visits each year in Bar Harbor, and the arrival of Airbnb is also, um, and other home reservation systems is spreading visitation a little bit, making it harder to work on transportation issues. 95% of visitors still arrive at Acadia via automobile, so that continues to be a large issue to address. But I should also point out that Acadia's visitors spent more than 387 million in local communities and supporting over 5,600 jobs. So we'll move over to Misha now, who will talk a little bit about why community partnerships are important. Right, so um, thank you, Stephanie. And thanks, Kevin, for um, introducing some of these, these issues a bit already. Um, so when Stephanie and I were preparing for this presentation, we were trying to think about the, the main reasons why these community partnerships are important to the park and to um, increasing the amount of landscape conservation that can be done around the park. And we came up with five basic categories. The first is that natural resources, they just pay no attention to the same boundaries that people pay attention to. 
Uh, so Acadia National Park actually has a very clear political boundary that dictates what lands it can acquire. And there are still roughly 100 important privately held lands inside that boundary. However, both ecological and scenic resources do not typically follow those boundaries. Um, the park is a relatively small area here on Mount Desert Island, a small area with lots of amazing features and lots of visitors. Um, but important habitats uh, typically cross right over the boundaries. So an example of that um, is a really special place in the Acadia National Park is Northeast Creek. It's this pristine estuary in the park, uh, but it has also become Maine Coast Heritage Trust primary ecological focus area in the park because portions of that estuary go beyond Acadia's legislated boundary. So we, we pick up the work, uh, the ecological protection work, where Acadia really has to leave off. Um, the other thing that we're often doing um, in terms of crossing those boundaries is uh, protecting scenic vistas. So some of the things that people are looking at from uh, mountaintops or favorite trails within Acadia National Park are landscapes that are outside those boundaries. And Maine Coast Heritage Trust has worked with partners to protect the lands that really make those uh, scenic viewpoints beautiful. So uh, the second category um, about why community partnerships can be important is that partners may have access to different financial resources um, than the park itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so most notably, that is private philanthropy. Both Friends of Acadia and Maine Coast Heritage Trust have really been um, fundraising engines um, for projects that are important landscape conservation projects around the park. Um, but it has also meant state and federal grants. Um, we have a kind of interesting and very recent example uh, where a uh, landowner, our, our first project that we've done this way, a trade land project, where a landowner who was a longtime supporter of Friends of Acadia and Acadia National Park wanted to donate her property to the park, not as a conservation resource, but as a financial asset. And the park just wasn't in the position to accept that land and sell it to have the proceeds invested back into conservation projects, but Maine Coast Heritage Trust was. And so we just actually recently, after holding this property for two years that was donated to us, we were able to sell it, and that land is going to cycle back into, I mean, the, the resources from the sale are going to cycle back into priority land conservation projects. The third thing is that uh, partners are often more nimble than federal agencies. Kevin uh, alluded to this earlier, but I think generally we are able to work more quickly than the park services in acquiring land. Um, my experience has been that when we pre-acquire land for the park, it, we have held those properties for anywhere from two to seven years before transferring to the park and um, when a property is actually actively listed for sale um, or even when it's not, landowners are, are not often willing to wait the amount of time it takes for the park to acquire lands directly. Uh, partners can absolutely magnify the park's con constituency and communications. Uh, Friends of Acadia has um, a tremendous membership of approximately 5,000 people, and those are people that are advocating for the park and doing direct work um, in and around the park. And Maine Coast Heritage Trust and Friends of Acadia are using um, newsletters, journals, social media, um, all sorts of ways to communicate um, messages beyond folks that are directly visiting or hearing things from the park. And then finally, uh, partners may have the flexibility to address complex or delicate issues. Um, some examples that we have of that here is that often putting a land conservation project together um, may involve a component that's a very clear ecological conservation project, perhaps inside the park boundary, but there may be a portion of the property that's well suited for active farming or housing development, um, which is an important community need here on Mount Desert Island. And so we are often in a position to piece together a complex project that meets multiple park conservation goals, but also other community goals, um, where the park might not be able to do that on their own. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass over to Stephanie um, to talk a little bit about Friends of Acadia's work. So Friends of Acadia has uh, been working with the park and Maine Coast Heritage Trust for a while, really on this uh, land conservation partnership. We call this the Acadia Land Legacy Program. 
we rely on each of our individual strengths, I would say, in this partnership. Maine Coast Heritage Trust really brings to the table all of the landowner negotiations and the legal work and uh, Friends of Acadia assists with a little bit of fundraising. Um, and the photo that you see on the right side there is the Porcupine Islands um, that you can see from the summit of Cadillac Mountain within the park. Right behind the cruise ship is an island, Burnt Porcupine and Rum Key, that is the charismatic example of a land project we would want to undertake should the opportunity to purchase it arise. In the Porcupine Islands chain, um, Burnt Porcupine is the only island that is not owned by the park. So if the landowner were to offer it up, FOA and MCHT would acquire it and hold onto it until the funds were available through the Land and Water Conservation Fund to add it to the park. So that's essentially how the partnership works on land conservation. The other way that we try to fundraise to help the park on uh, landscape conservation and communities is through support for an initiative called Wild Acadia, which is an initiative to restore ecological integrity and to help the park's natural resources thrive in the face of threats of climate change, inf insect infestations, and other rapid ecological change. The work in the Wild Acadia initiative is watershed-based, so projects may easily extend beyond the park into local communities. The second way we try to help with landscape conservation is by, by advocacy, really fighting threats to the landscape. The images that you see here are of a projection of a 195-foot cell tower that's been proposed for a ridgeline within four miles of the park's boundary. Most other cell towers in the region are approximately 125 feet tall and are uh, camouflaged as to look like local trees. FOA and the park were concerned about the impacts that this tower would have on the views from the park's trail system, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We asked the applicant to float balloons to help us assess the potential impacts from the trail system and from other significant historic resources in the area. We prepared advocacy alerts to encourage FOA members to get out and hike the trails during the balloon test and to weigh in with the FCC the main historic preservation officer and with the applicant. The photos here were prepared by an FOA staff member and the top one you can see where the arrow is that points to uh, the, three, the balloons um, that would show the height of uh, the tower. And then the second slide is uh, a visual analysis that was prepared here on staff showing what the tower would look like. Um, the historic preservation officer fortunately for the state has just determined that the tower would have a significant impact on the historical integrity of Acadia's trail system. And they've recommended that mitigation measures be established by the applicant. So I just put this out here as a demonstration that advocacy can be an important way to help preserve landscapes near parks. And I'll add that town planning can also be an important function your group can get involved with, whether advocating for things like lighting ordinances and noise ordinances, or perhaps building covenants to try to make uh, development outside the park fit better into the local landscape. All of that will help with landscape conservation. The third way we've been involved is through transportation projects. As I mentioned, automobile congestion is a significant issue here at Acadia in, in the gateway communities. And one of the ways we're working to advance landscape conservation is to encourage visitors to leave their cars behind and take public transportation or walk or bicycle into the park. FOA has been a longtime supporter of the Island Explorer propane powered transit system that picks up passengers at hotels and campgrounds and village centers and takes them to the park and other destinations. The system has been wildly successful. It's carried more than 8 million passengers since its founding in 1999. And we're partnering with the Maine Department of Transportation, Maine Office of Tourism, Federal Transit Administration, the park, Federal Highways and Downey's Transportation to plan and hopefully construct soon the Acadia Gateway Center which will serve as a regional transit hub and visitor center planned for Route 3 on the approach to Acadia. And you can see the artist's representation of what it might look like in the image at, uh, to the right there. And then the third thing that I would just like to mention is that we've also been investing in bike racks, <coughs> excuse me, in the park and funded the construction of five village connector trails to encourage people to walk and bicycle directly to the park. Sorry about the cough here. <coughs> Another way that we try to help the park preserve landscapes is by funding seasonal staff and interns who extend the work that the park staff is able to do, sometimes even outside park boundaries. 
the image on the right is Brian Henkel, a Wild Acadia coordinator who has worked with the town of Bar Harbor to write grants and improve stream crossings on town roads to allow for better aquatic organism passage. Many of these streams originate in the park but flow through local communities before reaching the sea. The park can do a lot to fix their own stream crossings, but it takes partnerships outside park boundaries to truly restore stream habitats throughout their reaches. We also fund summit stewards that you see on the left who play a role in educating visitors about leave no trace principles. And we hope that uh, those visitors return to their own communities and start practicing those uh, principles. And we have a teacher program here as well, where teachers come to the park to learn field teaching techniques and commit to educating their students about national parks, even bringing their classrooms back to Acadia or another national park on a field trip. So all of these efforts, we hope, extend the park's capability to reach a broader audience and we hope that those contacted, whether students, park visitors, or public works officials, will connect themselves to park landscapes as they consider their own actions moving forward. And finally, um, we believe that any effort to get involved in local community programs and initiatives will help establish trust, that Friends, in the, Friends of Acadia and the Park and Maine Coast Heritage Trust are accessible, we're interested in discussing issues, and we're interested in working together on projects to preserve and celebrate the landscape. The photos here are a quilt, local quilt show that celebrated the park during the park's centennial in 2016, a wild Acadia presentation at our local library, the Imprecision Drill Team, which is a, they're volunteers for Friends of Acadia in the park who march in the 4th of July parade as a way to encourage more volunteerism, and a community volunteer removing roadside trash during our annual Earth Day roadside cleanup. But what I didn't show here is the relationship that I perhaps value the most in that I serve on our local Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, and I feel like that really helps open lines of communication between business interests and conservation organizations, which is important as the park begins to tackle transportation and tourism issues. So with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Misha, who will discuss Maine Coast Heritage Trust's role. Sure, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so uh, there are a few bullets here about how Maine Coast Heritage Trust has helped Acadia and the Gateway communities advancing landscape conservation. So the first example, which I'll talk a little bit about, is our Acadia Land Legacy Partnership with Friends of Acadia um, and with the park. And, and that's really our program to um, enable protection of inholdings in the park. So I mentioned there are still about 100 um, privately held lands scattered uh, amongst the, the park lands. Um, some of these are larger charismatic properties such as um, Burnt Porcupine, which we've mentioned before, which is an island that you see from many places in the park. Uh, but other places are smaller and, um, you know, not necessarily standalone huge significant conservation projects, but they are really important to the integrity of their park. They're basically holes, they present boundary issues or stewardship issues, and um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust has been working um, for a number of years, but really formally with Friends of Acadia since about 2004, is that right, Stephanie, to, uh, to help acquire these lands. Um, we have some interesting tools that it's worth touching on uh, related to that program. We operate according to a, a memorandum of understanding. We have a formal MOU with Friends of Acadia that lays out how we work together. Uh, Friends of Acadia holds this land bank, which is basically our, our key financial resource well, it's a revolving loan fund, basically, that we can um, turn to when we have the opportunity to work together to acquire a, a piece of land um, and then hold it for a while and then hopefully sell to the park when land and water conservation funds are available. Um, and then those funds go back into the revolving fund to replenish for the next project. So it's been an incredibly successful program. Um, I think we do. It, it works well because we take on the piece of the partnership that we're best at. Um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust tends to stay pretty focused on the transactional aspects, uh, working with the landowners in this region who we tend to have, you know, for the most part, very positive relationships. Like Kevin mentioned, um, landowners will often think to come to us first or they know someone who's worked with us in the past. Um, so Maine Coast Heritage Trust stays focused on that piece. And Friends of Acadia tends to focus more on advocacy and operating this revolving loan fund. Um, uh, so uh, that's, that's worked really well. And we've been able to accomplish a lot over the years. Um, 
I just have a few statistics here, but since the program was really formalized around 2004, uh, we have facilitated um, about 10 projects. Um, we've also helped uh, bring in other partners to acquire nine additional parcels. So, um, and, and we are holding one piece right now that we are hopeful we will be able to transfer to the park in the coming, in the coming months or years um, when land and water conservation funds are available. So <clears throat> that's the Acadia Land Legacy Partnership and that's really our most fundamental program for acquiring, helping the park to acquire land. Um, I should mention that, that Maine Coast Heritage Trust also has a really long history of working with Acadia National Park on a conservation easement program. Um, <coughs> we have worked with the Park Service to help the Park Service secure about 200 conservation easements that um, protect scenic and ecological values on roughly 12,000 acres around Acadia National Park. Um, the conservation easement is a tool that other parks have used, um, but certainly Acadia has been the, one of the places that really led with the use of this tool, um, and they've been accepting easements um, pretty steadily since the mid-70s um, when we started this program. So it's accomplished a lot. Much of the conserved landscape that you see um, when you're enjoying the park and you look out around the islands um, is still privately owned, it's still land that's on the tax rolls, but has been protected through the use of conservation easements. And one of the roles of Maine Coast Heritage Trust there is to, to be an advisor. We are often actually negotiating and working with landowners on behalf of the park. Um, we are often drafting documents for them. Um, so we play a number of roles um, behind the scenes often in making those conservation easements happen. <coughs> so it's sort of a side piece of our Acadia Land Legacy Partnership um, specific to conservation easements. So we also work outside um, the park's boundary, protecting, restoring habitat um, and recreation corridors. So um, an example of recreation corridors, Acadia National Park is an amazing place to recreate. There's a, a, just an amazing network of hiking trails and carriage roads. Um, <clears throat> and they come, in many cases, very close to our communities. Um, but, you know, Stephanie has mentioned we have worked to connect those trails into the communities and the role that Maine Coast Heritage Trust will often play is working with the landowners, working with a private landowner that may own a strategic piece of, of property in between um, the park and the community. And we've worked to um, talk to them about would you be willing to work on a trail easement. We've been ones to actually draft those documents, sometimes temporary, sometimes permanent trail easement documents. Um, those are trails that Maine Coast Heritage Trust later down the road doesn't have anything to do with actually maintaining. Um, it's often Friends of Acadia or the Park Service, but we play an important role um, in, in doing the negotiating and drafting and sort of technical assistance behind those projects. That's <clears throat> what our, our specialty is. Um, also beyond um, the recreation pieces, so we've, we've worked to protect habitat, certainly I mentioned that our ecological focus areas really pick up where the Acadia boundary leaves off, um, but more broadly we've, we've helped with um, studies, ecological studies, so oftentimes the park will, if, if they're involved in a research project, like I have an example here in the photo of a, a smelt survey, so this is a, a photo of park service staff doing uh, fish count studies, uh, where they're wanting to look at a variety of streams, both in the park, but also places that are surrounding the park. And they'll come to us to use our property. So this is the property that we own on Babson Creek, which flows into land that the park owns. Um, so we will we'll provide sites and support for doing ecological studies. Stephanie mentioned um, the work of Wild Acadia around working with communities on stream restoration and fish passage projects. But that, that's something that we've been able to get involved with as well. So the park took a first step um, at doing a really thoughtful inventory of stream crossings within Park Service land. Well, Maine Coast Heritage Trust was able to bring some resources to the table so that study could be expanded island-wide. So we were looking at the portions of the streams um, that were outside the park and really um, there's no point in improving stream passage <laughs> within the park 
service if downstream you have a, a dam or a bad culvert or you know something blocking the stream passage um, in in the community nearby. So we've been able to kind of work with friends of Acadia um, and others to complete those studies to really take a look at our whole our um, our whole place here on Mount Desert Island, not just what's what's inside the park. Uh, in terms of increasing, we, we've really been increasing our effort to try to protect resilient landscapes for habitat migration in the light of climate change. I, there's sort of two categories that I think about this in. Um, one was referred to in the, the summary for this webinar, but our Scudic to Scudic initiative. So Acadia has this amazing um, Scudic district of its parts. It's separate from, from the lands on Mount Third Island. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful section of the park, um, but it's it's small and it's right at the tip of this peninsula, and it's quite separated from large chunks of other conserved land. And there's been concern over the years that that would really be a, an issue in the long term for the park. Would habitat habitat be able to migrate in? Would even plant species be able to move as climate changed here on the park? And so a number of years ago, Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Um, really took the lead on an initiative to protect key properties that would connect the Scudic District with larger blocks to the north of protected land. And we've been successful working with a number of partners now with protecting over 33,000 acres of land in that area. And, and the work is not done, but we feel like we're well on our way to having a much more connected and resilient um, landscape there. Another piece of this climate resiliency is that we've been working to um, inventory and try to protect a sort of special habitats that we think are, are really at threat with climate change. Um, the biggest one that we're focusing on right now is salt marshes. So trying to think about what's gonna happen when as sea levels rise, um, what's gonna happen to our salt marshes, which are really rare in this part of the state, but important. And we're working to protect the uplands around these salt marshes where we think they're going to be able to migrate to over time. Um, and then just this puzzling complex deals together to meet multiple park and community goals. Um, there's a great example of a project, uh, we call it our, the Pooler Farm Project, but this property came up for sale. It was over 100 acres. Um, a significant portion of that property was within the park's acquisition boundary and really important to a key resource within the park, the Northeast Creek. Um, so we, we knew something needed to happen, but then there was the farm, the, the working farm piece of the landscape, and then there was also a bunch of other land that wasn't in the park boundary, wasn't really part of the farm, and, and didn't have a lot of important conservation values. And so Maine Coast Heritage Trust was able to help bring partners to the table and facilitate a project that turned into a really important acquisition for Acadia National Park of shore frontage on this important estuary. But it also um, resulted in a farmland conservation easement on the working farm area. And then finally, it resulted in a partnership with a, a local housing authority, affordable housing authority for an affordable housing development um, on another component. So, uh, you know, we were in a position to bring together multiple partners and, and interests um, for a complex project that took years, took years to complete. And then finally, assisting with town and community planning. Um, we try to be at the table with important community planning initiatives. One example is that um, Bar Harbor, which is one of the you know, key communities here surrounding Acadia National Park recently um, worked on an effort to develop an open space plan for their community. And certainly, um, and we were part of that effort. We took a um, strong role in identifying important farmland projects. But so that open space project was really comprehensive. They were looking at conservation values that were beyond the values that the park would typically look at about more ecological or scenic focused values. Um, and so we can play a role in community planning efforts like that. So we try to think a little bit about what the lessons are that we've learned in working together on these landscape conservation projects. And so we have, we have a few, and I'll, I'll jump into the first one. Um, the first one is that it's really important to clarify roles and communicate often. So as I mentioned, um, we've kind of 
fallen into some niches naturally over time as, as we've worked together and figured out, you know, what do we each do best? But we have formalized those roles through an MOU. And I think that's been really important. It's a document that we can go back to um, when we're deep in a complicated project and trying to figure out, you know, how do we move forward? It's a document that we've revisited. I think we renew it like on a five-year basis. And sometimes that means just looking at it and saying, well, no, everything looks fine. It's working as it should be, but we have the opportunity to, to dig into it and, um, and talk about it if it's not. Um, and then informally, we, we communicate a lot with each other. And one of the most important things related to communication is never speaking for your partner. Um, it's important in any relationship to ensure that everyone has an individual voice, but that's sometimes why press conferences like what you see here may have a thousand speakers. We also strive not to surprise our partners ever with decisions, speeches, or comments in the press that the partner may not have been expecting. Off-camera discussions and conversations to understand each partner's position are particularly valuable. I also want to stress that when you're looking at a landscape conservation project or a project that you might want to get involved in, it's important to focus on your organization's missions and uh, don't feel like you have to take on every project. Perhaps there's an opportunity to find a partner if a project doesn't match up with your organization's interests. At Friends of Acadia, we have a projects policy that encourages us to think through questions such as all the ones listed here. Does the project match our strategic plan and our mission statement? Do we have adequate financial and staffing resources? Will our participation be positive? Are there, would there be any long-term detrimental impacts if we didn't get involved? So um, your own organization might wanna think about putting that together if you don't already have that. Another important lesson is to give credit where credit is due. Um, so we you know, make sure to be generous in our acknowledgements. We make sure to recognize our partners both you know, personally, privately, but also publicly, and when we do so publicly, running that by each other, so we make sure we're thanking each other the way we we want to be thanked. Um, and for Main Coast Heritage Trust, I just want to mention that it's especially important that we are giving credit to landowners for our landscape conservation work. You know, for us, that's primarily all um, only happening because we have willing landowners who, who want to work with us. So we're making sure to always sort of put them first and thank them first and make sure that they are hearing and other landowners are hearing a clear message about how important they are to <clears throat> conservation efforts at Acadia. We also think that it's important for your organization to keep track of statistics and annual accomplishments and make sure to celebrate those together with your partners. At Friends of Acadia, I'm responsible for reporting out our program accomplishments to our donors each year. And I often find myself wishing that I had Excel spreadsheets that were established that I could just plug in numbers of volunteers, numbers of kids served by our annual programs, acres of land protected, and so much more. But when you work in partnership, oftentimes it may not be you who's actually doing the work. You may have to rely on a partner to give you those statistics, so it's best to try to give them ample time before reporting is due, or to put yourself also in your partner's shoe and think about what kind of statistics would they want from me and try to keep those at hand and be ready to uh, report those out to them. Um, I also really want to stress celebrating your successes together is important, especially when you've been in an organization as long as I have. Sometimes you downplay the work that you do but uh, celebrating with partners together can reinforce that, hey, we did something really good today and our work together brought us farther along than we could have done so individually. Okay, and um, finally, it's important to get out and enjoy the land um, that you're working on. And we don't, we don't, we were just saying, we don't do this enough actually, um, but whenever we do, it really helps um, bolster our, our ability to work together. So to get out, this is a picture of uh, Friends of Acadia and Park Service staff and, and Main Coast Heritage Trust uh, on a field trip on Northeast Creek, one of these areas that we've been working in together. Um, but not only is it important to be out on the land and enjoy the land, it's important to have some personal time getting to know each other. So as there is uh, turnover potentially at partner organizations or at the Park Service, it's been really valuable when we've had the chance to get together in person um, Stephanie and I are lucky we just work across the island from each other and we're able to you know, see each other in person if we need to. But in terms of working with partners that are 
further afield or in a regional office for the Park Service, it really, really helps when we have occasional opportunities to get together in person and know each other. It just makes getting through tricky moments in complicated projects much easier. Um, so finally, um, we wanted to just leave folks with a couple of um, suggested resources that we've found valuable um, in this kind of work. And so we'll just run through a couple of those before um, having time for questions. The first is um, the Land Trust Alliance, which is the national land conservation organization. Um, it represents more than a thousand member land trusts. Um, it's based in Washington, D.C., but has regional offices, and they are really the place to find information on potential land trust partners in your area. They offer many, many educational resources, um, largely through a really excellent website, but it also includes an annual conference called the Land Trust Rally, which has workshops on landscape conservation. So um, they're a great resource. And uh, the National Parks Friends Alliance is an informal affiliation of friends groups supporting national parks. The alliance has a steering committee and organizational support from the National Park Foundation. The group has uh, typically held two meetings each year in the past, um, but they're also moving more towards forming affinity groups around things like fundraising or education initiatives. So it's possible there could be another one around community conservation if there's enough interest moving forward. Um, they all, their meetings each year also provide opportunities for presentations on topics of interest, information sharing, and networks among peer groups. The Public Lands Alliance is also is a nonprofit membership organization whose mission is to connect, strengthen, and represent the nonprofit partners of America's public lands, not just national parks. So that's one benefit I find through them is that you link into friends groups supporting the U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, state parks, and more. They have also have great tools on their website, including recorded webinars, an advocacy toolkit, and a guide on best practices for, for partner organizations. And they're particularly helpful, I think, in fostering the development of young organizations and encouraging networking among friends groups and cooperating associations. So definitely check them out. Um, and then the National Park Foundation, so uh, being the official nonprofit partner of the Park Service, um, National Park Foundation supports projects um, in many ways uh, for the park, they bring, um, they can bring resources to land projects. So in our case, um, they were able to bring, recently provide uh, funding to help bridge a gap that we had in a priority land protection project at a place called Gilco Pond in the park. It was the largest remaining inholding in the park and um, we were able to pre-acquire it for the park, but we were not able to sell it um, to the park for quite as much money as we had invested. And so, um, both Main Cliff Heritage Trust, FOA, but also the National Park Foundation was able to bring resources to that project. And that was incredibly helpful. And um, Dan Sakura has been the key contact um, from Main Cliff Heritage Trust perspective at NPF for land uh, protection project par partnerships. And an organization that's been particularly helpful to Friends of Acadia is the National Parks Conservation Association. Uh, NPCA is a leading advocate at the national level for national parks and they help fight threats such as air pollution, oil and gas exploration, and uh, funding issues um, that affect our parks. And we rely on them constantly as a resource of information for, for those of us who are in the field. They're on the Hill every day in Washington. Uh, also, they have field offices. Um, so we rely on them quite a lot for information. And they can also bring citizen advocates to your park if a community-based conservation issue arises at your park that may require advocacy as one of the um, possible ways to address it. So, and also, as Brian mentioned at the beginning, the National Park Service, of course, is a great resource uh, that we I didn't list here. We should have as a partner organization, yeah. <laughs> but um, the Partnerships Office has tremendous resources available to you and uh, and the National our, our of course, our local park as well. So um, with that, we'd be happy to turn it over for questions. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and Misha. There's, I, I, I took a ton of notes, um, probably more so than any other webinar over the years. Um, thank you for awesome presentation. Um, again, folks, if you have questions, you can type them into the questions box. Uh, that way, I can see them and I can uh, uh, read them uh, to to Misha and um, 
Stephanie and as well as Kevin is, is with us still. So I, I have a question, and it's kind of maybe for all three of you. Um, you guys can figure it out who best to field it. So it seems like, you know, visitation is going through the roof there. You've like, you know, 50% up over the last decade, um, you know, like 4 million in a relatively small park. It's That's crazy. Um, has that then, it's kind of like a two-part question then, has that also led to more, you know, development pressure and more proposals to have more development, more hotels, more restaurants, more sprawl, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the second part of that is, has there also then, from that visitation, um, have locals um, been more interested and willing to look into private land conservation because they see a lot of this stress on park resources in the broader area? Um, and at the same time, you know, for for some of these communities like Bar Harbor, where are they um, becoming more interested in community planning efforts. It sounds like a smart, you know, uh, open space plan for Bar Harbor. But I mean, how about some of the other communities? Are they, how are they reacting essentially to this increased visitation and and and, and uh, associated pressure if it, if it in fact is there? Yeah. There's um, a. There's I'll, a I'll start. This is Stephanie. Oh, Kevin, go ahead. No, no, please, Stephanie. <laughs> I'll, I'll chime in after you. Well, I was just going to compliment Acadia for um, tackling transportation as one of the biggest issues here. And when Kevin arrived, um, the park really started working on a comprehensive transportation plan that um, is going to be critical to the future and to maintaining, I would say, a calmer tourism experience here. And there are elements of the transportation plan that include things like um, establishing timed entry reservation systems for key destinations in the park, also reducing the length of buses traveling through the park, um, uh, investing more in public transportation options, and, uh, and helping to um, provide uh, concessions to our operators as well, um, to, and also investing in, or not, the park's not going to invest in it, but um, ensuring that organizations like Lyft and Uber can access the park as well. So I think really addressing that transportation nut has been a key factor in trying to preserve our our local community landscapes. Um, Kevin, did you want to add to that? No, I think that's a, that's actually that's a great summary, Stephanie. I think um, you know I think what has changed you know in Brian and first. Part of your question with regards to more development, what has changed in the last 10 years is not necessarily new hotels here on Mount Desert Island as much as it is the Airbnb and VRBO community. I think that if if we were to rewind the clock 10 years and say to the community, gee, there's going to be, you know, 500 or 800 new hotel room units that are three bedrooms each. Um, you know, people would kind of raise their eyebrows, I think, and that's just kind of happened organically as a result of of the the sharing economy and Airbnb and that sort of thing. So that's changed the the game for for us. It's changed the game for housing for us for our workforce. Uh, in the summer, it's impossible for people to find a, a six month rental because everything's rented by the week. Um, and and I, I know a lot of parks are dealing with that similar kind of issue in their in their communities. Um, we're seeing growth in in the region in terms of overnight accommodation for sure. And, and so, as Stephanie said, that transportation plan that we've created um, in consultation with the community and our partners really is key for us to to manage visitation, allow allow visitation to to still grow because it's going to, uh, but in a sustainable fashion. Fantastic. I guess I just add a little bit to the very last part of your question about kind of like the appetite for new conservation projects is that one thing that we're definitely seeing um, is that there is an appetite for for local folks um, to have more different alternatives than just the park in terms of places to recreate and enjoy um, the environment here and because the park can be so crowded or 
you know, occasionally um, have access limited during a shutdown or something, they they are looking to their Main Coast Heritage Trust as um, to provide alternatives. So we we do own a number of small preserves on this island. There they tend to be quieter places, lesser known places in Acadia National Park, which is where locals might go when um, the park is at its most crowded moment. Um, and, and there's just been an increasing interest in that, um, certainly as the park has, has taken on more visitors. Great. All right, um, here's a question. I'm curious if, other, uh, if either organization has ever worked with the NPS's um, RTCA program, that's Recreation Trails Conservation Assistance Program. This is Stephanie from Friends of Acadia, and we absolutely have. Uh, they've been instrumental in our Village Connector Trails program. Uh, we had the the difficulty is that the RTCA office here in the state of Maine is down in Brunswick, which is about you know three and a half or three hours away. Uh, but the folks at that office were really outstanding, working with our community committees who were looking at potential trail routes and old connections and how do we reestablish this? And then um, also walking the trails and flagging different routes for us to consider in all conditions uh, from black fly season to deep snow. So I, RTCA has been a tremendous help here with our Village Connector Trails program. Great. All right, here's another one. Um, do you have a set of biotic and abiotic indicators that you all monitor over time? Are you using citizen scientists to assist in monitoring? Thanks for all you do. Absolutely. Um, uh, inside the park, of course, the Northeast Temperate Network program is well established and monitors forest plots. Um, they look for in wetlands plots and uh, various um, indicators within that, both uh, biologically in terms of plant species and then uh, abiotically in terms of, I guess there's the water quality and air quality sampling program as well that occur in the park. Um, through the Wild Acadia Initiative, we have also tried to supplement that work with additional stream monitoring sites out, inside and outside the park as well as um, working with partners um, to try to increase the amount of research that's being done inside and outside the park. And I will say um, there's a great organization who's not on the call with us today, but the Scudic Institute, uh, which is a, another support organization for the park, has a wonderful citizen science program um, where they really do foster learning about citizen science and encouraging individuals to take this up also encouraging use of um, things like iNaturalist and other programs for reporting data and so on. So that's a big part of our park here. Great. Uh, here's another question. Uh, Stephanie, your, your involvement with the local Chamber of Commerce, how has that been and, and how has it been what have been the surprises and what have been the challenges with uh, being a, a, a member of that? Oh, great question. Uh, the biggest surprises are that I love it as much as I do. I really, really value the relationships that I've developed in town through that program and the trust that we've built. The trust to, I would say, even I cry isn't easily as a person, but I have cried in those meetings before when I get passionate about an issue and they forgive me. <laughs> and that's what I love. Uh, and I think um, the challenges are, some of them are personality based um, and you learn to work with people who have their own agendas and they sometimes forget to check those agendas at the door and come together to think about the chamber as a whole. Um, but I really, have found that the organization of the chamber itself is sharing many of the same goals that the park does and the Friends of Acadia does. Um, specifically, we all want visitors to have a good time and to have the kind of experience that they're looking for. And recently, the chamber has, um, in a couple of instances, really come out and said, we think that the transportation plan, that the, the ideas that the park is 
working on are important to pursue, and I was really pleased to see that. I think the biggest area where we continue to see challenges is in the growth of the cruise industry here, um, because that creates a lot of bus traffic in the park and it creates congestion downtown somewhat. So moving forward, I think that's going to be another area that we really need to keep that dialogue going. All right, can you tell us more about how the bus system at Acadia works? Who coordinates it, pays for it, and what is the and what are the parks uh, and the partners' roles? Um, and then also, uh, is the park transportation plan available to others? Yes, uh, this is Stephanie again. The Transportation system here, the Island Explorer, was started in 1999, uh, although the need for the transportation system was identified way back in 1992 as part of the park's general management plan. Um, and it really, it's a multi-leg stool that would not survive without each of the partners. So the major funding partner of the, transport of the transit system is uh, the National Park Service. Um, there is a transit fee that is charged that's part of every entrance pass that is purchased here at Acadia, the weekly and the annual passes. And uh, so that funding source brings in, I, I think, around 70%. Is that right, Kevin, of the Island Explorer's operating budget? Yeah, that, that's right. A little, bit, a little bit more like 75%, but yep. Okay. And then the other funding sources, the um, the state DOT contributes federal transit funds that are rural transportation funds that they receive through the formula and then they distribute to various transit systems throughout the state. Um, they also, we get about Friends of Acadia um, has a relationship with L.L. Bean, the outdoor retailer um, that brings in uh, funding to operate the bus system. The also local communities um, vote each year at town meeting to supply funds to the Island Explorer. All of the campgrounds and hotels that receive front door service contribute to the system. And passengers themselves, there's a donation box on board uh, that raises about $58,000 each year uh, for the operations of the bus system. So, and it's, so those are that's the funding kind of piece of it. Um, the operational piece of it uh, is that Downey's Transportation, which is a local nonprofit organization that was running transit uh, services throughout Hancock County surrounding the park, um, they actually have a, an, a, a cooperative agreement with the Park Service um, to, that allows them to receive that Park Service funding. Uh, and uh, so they are a recognized public transit system by the state and also a cooperating organization um, formerly with the Park Service, and they operate the bus system with these diverse funding sources. So, and for Friends of Acadia, just we we can do our grant more easily. We just contribute that annually with approval. We ask the park to say yes, go ahead and send it. But yeah, I hope that helps. And then Kevin, did you want to mention where people can get the transportation plan? Yeah, sure. It's it's available on our website. If you Google Acadia transportation plan, you should get to it. And you can also go to um, www.nps.gov slash ACAD slash transportation underscore plan dot htm, and you'll find it that way too. Great. We're about at four o'clock Eastern time. So before we um, uh, close up shop here, I wanted to make sure, Kevin, if you had any other additional. Uh, thoughts on, on the presentation today and all this that we've been talking about. I, I really appreciate, Brian, you for organizing it and Stephanie and Misha for, for presenting the really thorough presentation. Uh, they have incredible institutional knowledge and history here. And as you can see, you know, we have a, a really um, vibrant partnership with MCHT and Friends of Acadia. Um, it, it is uh, so important to what we do. It's, it's part of the secret sauce in Acadia National Park. And so um, I'm just really grateful to have, to have partners like you guys. It makes my job a heck of a lot easier and a lot more fun. So thank you all. Great, thank you so much, Kevin and, and Stephanie and Misha. Awesome um, presentation, one of my favorites for sure uh, so far.
Um, folks, our next um, webinar uh, that is again a part of our kind of focus on partnering with communities on conservation is on February 19 at three o'clock. And, and again, there's a link to register for that webinar in the in the chat box. Um, it's, our presenters are going to be Katie Allen and Kendra Riol um, with the Conservation Fund, and they're going to be talking about um, how gateway communities near parks can have vibrant economies while also conserving natural, cultural, and recreation assets. So similar but different to um, today's uh, conversation. Um, and as some of you may know, the Conservation Fund does a lot of advising and consulting to gateway communities on trying to maneuver and, and, and strike a balance, uh, navigate all those things, you know, and in, in, in conserving and protecting their way of life uh, while protecting, you know, uh, broader natural resources, all that. Uh, so it's, it should be a great presentation. So I encourage you all to register in advance for that. All right, again, um, Misha, Stephanie, thank you again for an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. It was a pleasure to be here today. Thanks, Brian. Great. All right, thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.